Good morning. We are starting a new quarter. And we're going old school with the whiteboard. Though I thought about it afterwards, I could have used my computer and just typed it in as you all said it, but probably would have been easier to read and might have made less mistakes. But <clears throat> we are starting a new quarter talking about evidences, and we'll talk about what that's going to mean a little bit more in a moment before we begin. Aaron, I think, is going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, but we're so thankful for all that you do for us in our lives. We're so grateful for the opportunity we have to stand before your throne. Father, we know it's through the name of your son, Jesus, that we have this privilege. And, Father, we consider it an honor to be able to do this. Father, help us to look into your word and to study it intensely. Father, help us to learn ways to encourage and strengthen our own faith, to help others in their faith. And, Father, help us to always walk in a path that glorifies you and your son. Father, as we study your word this morning, be with Brace and his his preparation, help him to have a good recollection, help us to be able to understand the, the differences and the thoughts and the things that are discussed today. Be with the, your church the world over as they study your word and grow in your ways. And Father, we pray that much good comes from the spreading of your word, that many people will, will see a different light, a different path in this, this dark and crazy world that we live in. And Father, help us to always be a light to those around us. Be with us this day. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be studying, talking about what we've called evidences. Um, sometimes people use a fancy word, apologetics, to talk about this particular subject. But the, the point is just going to be, as you're aware, as Christians, there is a lot of criticism um, with regard to the ideas of God, the idea that the Bible is inspired, the reality is the, the Bible is, has been a target for generations, uh, probably for as long as the Bible has existed. And it's going to continue. And part of that has to do with the fact that people don't like change. And the Bible calls on us to do some really hard things. That's part of the problem. Part of it is that we have become so enlightened that the idea in the society that we live in and have lived in, uh, people have lived in for generations now, is that we have become so knowledgeable of the way things are that we've been able to get rid of the crutch that generations before have used, which is God and the Bible, that they needed those things to explain the unexplainable. Um, and we don't need that anymore because we've learned many of the mysteries of the world and the thought is if we are allowed to survive long enough that we, if we don't evolve into something else, we'll figure out all the mysteries of the universe and we don't need God to explain the unexplainable. So there are a lot of reasons for why the Bible becomes a target, but the bottom line is people don't want to believe in what this teaches because of what it requires. Um, I mean, that's just the reality. And, and it does require a lot from us. I mean, there are a lot of blessings that go along with following these things, but there are also a lot of sacrifices that we have to make. I mean, that's just the, I mean, that's just the reality. And it calls on us to be different from the world that's around us, and being different um, causes us to be ostracized, and people don't like that. And so a lot of those things go into these attacks that we find on Scripture. There are <clears throat> going to be some things during this class that maybe you've heard before, maybe you haven't. There are going to be some things that sound like we're questioning the reality of what many of us have believed for perhaps decades. And in some ways, what we're doing is just presenting the questions other people in the world around us are presenting or have presented or may present. Because we ought to think about those things. And... I think generations past um, and maybe even present, one of the easiest ways to deal with that problem is just because of our conviction, because of what we know to be true, 
is just to explain it away, kind of wave our hands and act like it doesn't exist. Either to say, well, that's not really true, or I know what I believe and I know what the truth is, and therefore that can't be. But that's not going to help us when we're trying to study with somebody or talk to somebody who's outside of this, who doesn't have that conviction, doesn't have that understanding, doesn't have that realization, and hasn't done that examination before. And so I want us to approach this from the standpoint of looking at these questions, trying to look at them as objectively as possible. The reality is we all start with bias. Everybody in the world starts with bias. And that, again, is going to be a part of the root of the problem. When we look at, for example, evolutionary science as it's presented in public schools, whether it's middle school or high school or the college system, the people who teach those things begin with a premise, a worldview, that excludes the idea of God. They believe in naturalistic explanations for things. And that's going to shape how they interpret the evidence. And as we've talked about before in some of these evidentiary studies, the evidence is simply the facts. I mean, for example, I have two hands. I have five fingers on each hand. Those are facts. How did they get there? Did I evolve from primates, which have two hands, five fingers on each hand, or toes, whatever you want to call them, five digits on each of those hands? Did I evolve from primates, or did God create me this way? Your worldview, what you begin with, the bias that you start with, is going to have some impact, a great impact, in fact, on how you begin to interpret that evidence. Um, this is the evidence. What I do with that, whether I say I was created by God this way for a purpose, and these have purposes that God made them for, I begin there because that's my, that's my belief, that's my view. They begin with uh, evolution from primates because they begin with a view that says there can't be a God, and so I, this had to come from somewhere. And, and so they, they, they deduce and reason and go back through all of that evidence and explain it in those ways. So those are, that is a part of the issue. And we all begin, every one of us who are here in this building, begin with a worldview that accepts that there is a God and that this book is inspired by him. Now, the question is not, <clears throat> do we all begin with that? The question is, is there evidence for that? And that's what we're going to be looking at in the course of this study. There are people in the world who begin with a worldview that excludes God, and then they look at the world around them, and they look at things, and they say, is there evidence that supports that claim? And one of the pieces of evidence that people are, and maybe they've done this for generations, maybe this is something newer, um, but one of, the, one of the pieces of evidence that they've begun to use is comparing the law system that Moses reveals in the Bible with a lot of ancient law systems that we find in various places around the world and looking at the similarities between those and saying, well, Moses just borrowed from all of these other cultures or they were all borrowing from each other. And so all we have when we read the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and Exodus is that we have the Jewish version of those same laws that have been handed around by all these different nations. Now, <clears throat> is that a possible explanation? I'm just, I'm just going to ask that question. Is that a possible explanation? I'm not asking, is that the truth? I'm asking, is that a possible explanation? Joe. God is God. <laughs> It is because God is God, and God before before Moses, He talked to the fathers. Laws were taught to 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 those. They weren't written down at the very beginning because there was no writing. But yes, I mean from the Creator, I mean these 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 laws all are all together. Yes. So one possible reason why. I can't talk and write at the same time. I can barely walk and chew gum at the same time. So. Okay. 
So one possible explanation. So it, it is possible that they all borrowed from each other. And one of the explanations that is possible, and I think is a, is a reasonable explanation, is God gave laws to all men. We know that's true. That God gave a law to mankind in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, uh, is where it's revealed for us, or 2. And because of that, and because all men we believe have descended from that single pair, and then ultimately descended from Noah and his family after the flood and spread out from there, they would have all taken these laws with them. And that moral law that God gave to all of mankind is likely reflected in a lot of the things that he gave to the Jews in the law of Moses. We know there's some ceremonial laws, some laws with regard to religion that are clearly different and God, God singles those out and holds them up, saying that he's going to make the Jews a special, unique, different people from the rest of the people around them. But with regard to moral laws, how they were to treat their neighbor, how they were to deal with issues that would arise in the societies that they would create, those laws we could expect to be very similar. And so this is a possible explanation for that. Yes. Another possibility that I've seen presented is that when the children were of Israel were in captivity in Babylon, they were exposed to a lot of, of other cultures because that was a melting pot of the Babylonian empire. And that a lot of the writings, the written part of the law that we now have derived from that period of time when they were in captivity. So therefore they just absorbed all the other uh, cultures and their laws and put them and wrote them down and uh, presented them as being more ancient than they really were. You're talking about these other nations. So are you are you suggesting other nations borrowed from Israel? I was just saying that the Israelites borrowed from them. The the only question I would have about that is how does that explain what we find in the Bible? It was that borrowed, or are you talking about the the oral traditions and written traditions of the Jews that were handed down um, at this later time? Okay. Much earlier. I see what you're saying. Okay. So, so the argument there that Dan's talking about is the claim we, I mean, we believe. And the Jews believe that Moses wrote down the first five books around when? About what time here? Just give me a rough number. It doesn't have to be exact. 13, 1400 BC is approximately the time period in which most Bible believing people think that Moses wrote those things down. The claims of the, the skeptics um, and these other people who would, would would push this particular idea is that the Jews actually borrowed from those laws and these things were written at a much later time. And so, therefore, that's one of the reasons that it reflects. We're going to have to deal with that one a little bit, and that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, because on the surface, is that a possible explanation? Is that possible? I mean, again, that's all we're asking right now. We're not saying, is it right? We're saying, is that possible? Well, it is possible. It's possible because do we have any records 
of anything written by Israelites from the 1300s or 1400s BC. We didn't we don't? Okay, originally Andrew's right. Originally, the text that we got that we get our Old Testament from was the oldest complete Old Testament in the Hebrew language, and it dated to a thousand AD. It's a thousand years after Christ. Now, in the mid 1940s, there was a discovery made by accident, if you believe in such things, by a little Bedouin boy who was looking for some goats that had wandered off, and he started throwing some rocks into caves, and he heard some pottery shatter, and he went in, and what he found ultimately became the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. With that discovery, we now have nearly completed books of the Old Testament that date back to about 100 B.C. Guess what you find when you compare those documents from 100 B.C. to the document that we've had in 1080? Extremely consistent. The, 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 the dissimilarities, the differences between them usually result in perhaps the omission of a word or changes in spelling. But other than that, they match each other pretty well. And most fragments from most books of the Old Testament were found in those, those pieces of pottery and those protective vessels in those caves, which gives us strong evidence that the Bible that we have, the, 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 the Old Testament text that we have, it, is, it gives us good evidence that it's at least really close to what the originals were, or at least that particular document in 100 BC. Now, but with that, we'll go ahead. What were you saying? Oh, I was going to say, it still doesn't spread. That's where, I, that's where I was going to go. Okay, that's exactly right. That's where I was going to go next, and Andrew's right. It doesn't discredit this. It gives us good evidence that what we have is, is accurate, and that it's been handed down really well over that 1,100-year period, but it still doesn't discount this idea because we're talking about 100 B.C. When was the captivity? Yeah, four to 500 B.C. It, be, it began around 606 B.C. Um, and, and carried on for a, a period of about 70 years. Um, but there were still Israelites who were in Babylon after that time period. But anyway, so that's still about 400 years before that. So could they have borrowed and all the things that we're reading about 100, 100, AD, 100 BC be borrowed from Babylonian culture and the nations that they were a part of? Again, is it possible? Yes, still. So we're going to have to deal with that issue, but we're going to have to deal with that in a different way. Uh, Aaron has something. I think he said something for a while. There's a crazy notion, I must say crazy, that going around along some of the academics that it's possible that a lot of these laws could have been created in isolation amongst each culture. So the idea would be that because we're all human, a lot of the people that would be hurting other humans would be doing very similar things. And we've decided in a cooperative, cooperative society that some of these things are wrong. Um, now, to play devil's advocate, the people that are making these all live in a Judeo-Christian society, so there's also the fact that um, they're, they're living in a already pre-built moral structure. Okay, I could see making that. Are you making that from the Judeo-Christian perspective? Are you saying that's the that's the basis of that argument? Okay. Okay. Uh, 
it is is that again a possibility that there were groups of nations that got together in isolation kind of like a united nations of sorts and determined what the laws were going to be regarding societies all over the world came to some kind of compromises and agreements and ultimately just released that and they all released differing documents um, that uh, had a lot of similarities is that a possibility it's a possibility we're, we're just examining possibilities right now and we've got to be open to the possibilities. We, we can't just dismiss this and say, no, that, that's not what happened. I, I know that none of us here believe that this is what happened. But you can't just tell somebody who's looking at this and say, well, that's not what happened. Really? I mean, it sounds like a plausible explanation to me. I mean, it sounds like a possible explanation for how this all happened to me. Um, so how, how can you just... I mean, that's just waving your hand and, and making the evidence disappear. The evidence doesn't go away. It's still there. We're just not dealing with it. And people know that, and it's not going to help us. So it's a possibility. Ken? Also, those scrolls uh, uh, were, um, a lot of them were fragmented. The most of them they probably were. were fragmented. They were handled over and over, apparently, uh, even to the point of being offered uh, for sale. But uh, those scrolls were big. The discovery of those was so uh, verifiable back to the original word. Yeah, it, it, was, it was monumental in the area of biblical criticism because there had been a lot of criticism about the Old Testament because of, of the, 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 lo the long term between what was believed to be the original time period in which it was written and the time period that we had the copy from. Um, whereas with the New Testament, we have copies, fragments that date to within a couple decades of the period when the New Testament began to be written. And we have complete documents within a couple hundred years. The Old Testament span was, was vast. And so there was a lot of criticism there. And uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls helped to squelch a lot of that criticism and controversy because it was clear that at least during that 1100 year period, the transmission was pretty accurate. Um, okay, w what else can we do with some of this? I'm just looking for, we've talked about a couple of these now, but we'll talk about more of them later. I'm just kind of brainstorming explanations. And Joe, Joe's explanation <clears throat> you can almost see another one in it, but we'll 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 see if somebody else comes up with it first. If not, then we'll we'll go from there. Kind of like in Romans two, where it talks about by nature. Okay. They, there's the difference between people know the difference between right and wrong in their conscience. Okay. This is an argument from the Bible. But in fairness, I want, I want to talk about that for a moment. Because one of the things that we're often told is, when we start dealing with some of these issues is, prove God to me and prove the, prove, prove the Bible is his word without using the Bible. Is the Bible a piece of evidence on its own? Is it its own evidence? Is it a body of evidence? So should we not be able to use it? Just because someone is biased against the Bible and we're biased in favor of the Bible, can we not still look at the evidence of what the Bible presents that are, that are as, as best as I know, are, are facts that most people on both sides of the question could agree on. They're, they're facts. We might interpret those facts differently, but they're facts. Can we not deal with the facts regarding the Bible? Is that not fair? Is that is that that not as fair as dealing with the facts of the comparisons of similarity between the Code of Hammurabi or the Akkadians or the Sumerians or whoever it is and the Bible? Is that not as fair as or are they not both fair? We're talking about looking at evidence. We're talking about looking at facts. Now we're going to have to interpret that evidence at some point. But at least looking at the evidence, it seems fair to me to at least make suggestions on the basis of what we believe has a significant amount of evidence behind it as a possible explanation. Now, you may not agree with the explanation. You may not agree with 
the, the Bible as an inspired book to begin with. But we can, we can go through that question later. But is this a possible explanation? Romans 2, where Paul is making a transition from talking about the Jews and what they had to the Gentiles, speaks of some. Do you have that passage? Where it talks about some of the Gentiles, even without having the law, and I believe he's talking about the law of Moses, not law in general, um, had... Go ahead. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Okay, that's going to require us to deal with another word. which we'll do later. We're just brainstorming ideas. Okay, so men without law kept the law on the basis of their conscience because by nature they were, they were law-keeping or, or law-minded people. Correct. <laughs> Well, now you're going to have to deal with the other death of nature because... That's what I said. We're going to deal with that in a little bit. Because you could write it down again. Men by nature. The, the atheist argument is they don't like being concerned. They, they, are, they say no, by our nature, we have morals. And so it is human's judgment. If it is, if it is by nature, if it's just uh, innate to us, then the argument would be people that are separated by distance and culture will still come to very similar conclusions about what is right and wrong. And so that's the other use of the word by nature, I, I'm arguing. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are at least a couple of uses of nature, even scripturally, that uh, we'll, we, we will talk about a little bit more as we deal with this particular suggestion as to how we can answer this. Yes, ma'am. I'm not a detective, but I'm pretty impressed with them. And what they do is, as good as I can tell, is they gather all the evidence. And when they get to the bottom of it, some of it is, it, it had nothing to do with the crime. But they had to go through every single piece to figure out what did fit together. So that was just in support of your, um, we can't leave out the Bible because that is an evidence. You have to look at all of the evidence to come up with the right conclusion with the right uh, person who did the wrong thing. All of the evidence, some of it's trash, but you have to look at all of look it. Look at that. Underlining what? stars. Oh. Everything. That becomes an important point because here's why. Here's why that's so important. Because what you're going to find in some instances, I'm not saying all of them, because not everybody who's asked these questions has just skimmed the surface of the question and thrown the question out and said, there, the Bible's no nonsense. They, they don't do that. But there are some people who do. And there are some theories that are running around on the Internet where there are lots of claims that are made that if you do a little bit more investigating into those claims... They they don't exist. There's no evidence for it, and I know because I've done the I've done the research, and I've looked on non-Christian websites to do it. And the reason why I look at non-Christian websites is because this is going to shock you. Christians don't always deal fairly with the evidence either. And and in, in in fairness to the people that I'm talking about, I don't believe all of them are malicious liars. They are well-intentioned, they mean well, but they hear something and they don't really investigate it, and the end result is it ends up spread all over social media and it's not even true to begin with. We don't help our cause, we don't help the cause of Christ when we present flimsy evidence that has no real basis any more than the atheist does. But it requires you sometimes, or me sometimes, and the people that we're studying with to look at as much, and, and when I say all the evidence, and when Joy says all the evidence, I mean, the reality is 
That might take more time than you've got. But the point is just be thorough. Be thorough. Because it requires more than just looking at a little snapshot of it. Because the end result is, <clears throat> I could take a survey of the people in here and use it as representative of the, of the city of Columbus. Would that be accurate? Especially if it has a religious or moral slant. That'd be accurate. Could I use that and say, 80% of the people in Columbus say or believe that there is a God. That'd be accurate? Or That's exactly right. So that is about taking a, a larger body of evidence in order to make our conclusions and to draw those conclusions. Now, I want you to hear me very carefully because I'm already getting some looks. <clears throat> this study is not designed to weaken your faith. And I know, I think, I think sometimes that's what we're, we're afraid is going to happen, that we're going to, there are going to be doubts and questions and it's going to be bad and our faith is going to be weak. Now, if you take some of the things that we're talking about this morning or that you read about on social media and just run wild with it and don't do any research and try to answer those questions, then that could be a possibility. But if you will take the time to get engaged in the class and to look at some of the evidence and to think critically about some of these things, the end result in my, case, in my, in my studies with every single study I've ever done, whether it's on evidences or taking a Bible passage. I had somebody some years back that suggested that they took the Lord's Supper on a different day than Sunday on the basis of Acts 20, verse 7, and the timing. Now, I sometimes want to do what everybody wants to do, and that is just look at it and say, well, that's not true. I know that's not right, so I'm not even going to look at it. It's just wrong. But the end result was, I'm like, that's not the approach to use. I expect the people that I study with in the, in the world who have the same kind of mindset and conviction about their beliefs, I expect them to at least listen and, and examine and weigh and think. So I ought to do that. So I, I studied that pretty thoroughly. And the end result was I decided that what I believed about that passage was accurate. But it came through a lot of study. What if it hadn't? What if, it, what if I had come to a different conclusion? Well, then I ought to change what my practice is. Because is the Bible wrong? No. And if I'm reading accurately what the Bible says, then I find truth. And what should I do with that? Oh, that's not true because that's not what I've always believed. If I did that, I wouldn't be here. And I wouldn't have been baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. I'd be lost. So we have to examine. Is God, does God fear examination? There was a passage I was going to talk about with regard to this in, in the book of Haggai. I love it. There's also a passage in 1 John 4. I think John mentioned it maybe. Or maybe it was Andrew when we were talking the other day. Somebody mentioned it. See, that's why I like how they used to quote the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit said through Isaiah. They, 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 they didn't, of course, have book, chapter, and verse. They just had the books. Um, so it made it easy. Isaiah said it. You can go, you can go find it somewhere. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> in the days of Haggai, if you remember the context, they had come back from Babylonian captivity. They had begun to build the temple. And then because of threats from outside neighbors, they had stopped. And they had, had built their own houses and were living seemingly, I, I don't know, they, they were living in sealed houses. Um, I, I don't know if they were living luxuriously, although they could have been because the, the, the king of Persia, Cyrus, sent them back with a whole bunch of stuff. So maybe they were. Um, and so they, they were living in their homes and they were just going about normal everyday life, but they hadn't finished the temple. And God simply tells them in this particular book, um, in chapter 2, on the 24th day of the ninth month, uh, ch chapter 2, verse 10, 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches, his fold, uh, touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And the answer was no. 
Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by a contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Now, therefore, look at this, verse 15, consider from this day forward before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord. How did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you with all the products of your, and all the products of your toil, with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. What is he saying? They hadn't built the temple. They hadn't done what they had been sent back to do by the instruction of God and by the instruction of the king. They hadn't done it, and they've just gone about life, and they've planted their crops, and they've built their houses. And what's happened with their crops? They planted, and they, they we're the people of God. We're the people of God. We're the people of God. We're back in the land, and we're planting our crops. What's going to happen? Overabundance. What happened? There's not as much as we expected. What's going on? God says, consider, verse 18, from this day forward, or this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. From this day on, I will bless you. So they hadn't done what they were supposed to do, but now they laid the foundation of the temple, and what does God say? You just see, if now that you're doing what I told you to do, if now that you're observing what I said, you just watch and see if things don't turn out for you a little better than they did before. Right? What's God saying? God's saying you tried it your way and that didn't work so well for you. Why don't you do it my way and see if that works better? That's all he's saying. So he's telling them, you examine me. You test my ways. You see how it works if you do it my way. John in 1 John chapter 4 tells us to test the spirits. What's the point of that? Were they just supposed to test the spirits of the false prophets? Or were they supposed to test the spirits of the apostles too? Let me ask you a question. How do you know if it's a false prophet or a true prophet without testing them? In Acts, in Acts 17 in Berea, did the Bereans test Paul? They examined the scriptures every day to find out what? Whether what he said was true or not. He's an apostle of Christ. What gives you the right? I got every right. You claim to be speaking from God. I know this is from God. I know this old law was from God. It better be in agreement with what you say or you're a false prophet and a blasphemer and worthy of death according to that law. So they examined him. And, and that's what we're doing in this whole process. Does God fear examination? God exists. Is he afraid of you asking questions about him? Is he afraid of you examining his word to see whether or not it's true? Is he afraid you're going to find some flaw? No. Absolutely. The, it's one of the beauties of God, and it's one of the beauties of the Bible we'll talk about a little bit more later. God is not afraid. Now, are we afraid? I mean, just be honest. We are. We're afraid. What if I've been wrong my whole life? We're afraid. And that's why we're afraid to look at it. But God's not afraid. God's never been afraid. And, and I will tell you, if, if, if what we believe about these things is true, the more we do investigating, the more evidence we look at, what's going to happen? the more you're going to be convinced what? That it's true. That there is a God and that the Bible's His inspired word. And that's what has happened to me. The more evidence that I look at, are there times where I look at it and say, well, that's a pretty good argument. I don't really know how to answer that. one. Yes. We just looked at it. That's right. All of it. That's right. We just looked at it. So, I mean, the, the, it is faith. This is one of the other criticisms that gets leveled against faith. 
Faith is blind. It's just blindly trusting something that you can't, there, there's no evidence for and you, you can't see and all of that. Is faith believing in something we can't see? The answer is absolutely. Do you believe in things you can't see every day? I'm not talking about God. Are there things you don't see but you believe every day? Most of us do. I, I would dare say all of us, but maybe there's somebody out there who doesn't believe it unless they actually see it. But all of us believe things every day that we can't see because there's evidence for it. So the question is, is believing in something you can't see, blind faith, and trusting in something for which there's no evidence? Is it? Is it trusting in something for which there's no evidence? No, the very definition of faith in Hebrews 1, in Hebrews 11, 1 is that it is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. There, there is a basis for the reason we believe there is a God, and there is a basis for believing that the Bible is inspired. There is a whole lot of evidence, a preponderance of evidence, that exists that tells us that. And so when we examine the evidence, all we're going to do is find out that, that, that these things, we're going to find out the truth. And as Jesus said, you shall know the truth and what? The truth will set you free. John chapter 8. Yes, ma'am. And then Quick, um, back to the dates thingy and the bed, uh, Dead sea, sea Scrolls and how far back it kind of predates. Uh, it's interesting that it still doesn't go all the way back to day zero. And even if it did, it would still require faith because there would be people who would right. resist believing it. Well, uh, there will always be people who resist the evidence. I mean, we've seen examples of that in Scripture, too. And we see evidence of that in our own existence in life, too. Dan, go ahead. Well, if you want to talk about a pre-existing bias, you talk about the Jewish people and everything that... I mean, the, the disciples, the apostles were with Jesus for three plus years. They were men in their, I'm just going to throw out 20s to 40 years of age. They had hundreds of years of tradition that Jesus was going to come and, or the Messiah was going to come and reestablish the kingdom, physical kingdom. What's the last question they had before his ascension? Are you going to establish when, the kingdom? When, you're coming back establish and, when, the kingdom? when are you coming back to establish the kingdom? Yeah. What did Paul have to write constantly about? What I mean, the book of Hebrews it, so it was going on for 50, 60, 70 years. What do we fight today? Premillennialist. They think that the kingdom is still going still to be coming, coming and reestablished here. So there's a predisposed thought that this is the kingdom is physical, right? That Jesus came to establish. And even those that were closest to Jesus had so much different, if you want to call it baggage or predisposed, right? Or have been taught for so many years all of their life. That this is what's going to happen, they did not. They still didn't grasp it. Right. Greg's got something. And this might be a good time for my lecture here. Maybe. Um, or maybe not. If it's short, we don't have much time. Okay, I'll try to boil it down. We are discussing a, a very important issue as we talk about examining the evidence. So, what does the scripture say about the mystery? What's happened to the mystery? It's been revealed. Revealed. Does that mean we know everything there is to know about God? Clearly not. What does the Bible say about evidences supporting belief in God? These things have been written, but there's what? There's a whole mountain of evidence that we've never seen. All right? So as, as we talk about looking at evidence and we talk about uh, the idea of conviction, I think we need to remember two things that are becoming lost on our culture today. And one is the ability to have a critical eye in examining the credibility of the evidence. So I can find evidence that is less credible, and I can find evidence that is more credible. And I think our culture and our instantaneous uh, uh, accessibility to information is seen as evidence when what it is is uh, claims and beliefs and speculations for which we have assigned them the same weight of credibility. There are things that we can look at in our examination of the origins of the scripture, in the origins of religion, that uh, we may have a preponderance of evidence and we may have some weak links along the way. But we need to have the critical ability to say, 
when I find one piece of evidence, and it may have some credibility, is that enough to overthrow the preponderance of evidence that I have that supports my other position? And, and we think that is some sort of idea of, well, oh, I'm just going to be wavering. I'm going to be lost forever. Right. If there's something that might seem like it's important, but I haven't weighed how credible is the, the claim, how credible is the evidence supporting that claim, and it may be contradictory, and it may be contradictory until the day I die. But the truth is, the Bible says that the mystery has been revealed. So as we examine these things, our culture today is, is relying upon little bits and scraps of information from any source, even, even unnamed sources. Well, I read that on the internet. Well, good luck with that. You know, we've got to be able to establish that the things that we believe have credible backing. And I think that's why this kind of study is important to do. People can throw everything on the wall and see what sticks, but we need to be able to say critically, why, why should that matter? Because I don't, I don't understand your, your evidence doesn't have a weakness to the claim you're making. Or your evidence has weaknesses because there are counterclaims that can also be supported. And we as Christians need to be able to do that. Well, and a lot of people, uh, clearly a lot of stuff will stick because as John shared with us last week, there's a whole generation of people that believe literally means virtual. So clearly you can make anything stick if you get enough people to believe it. So, but uh, that is, that, that's a good point to make. Um, one other point with regard to gathering all the evidence, can you really gather all the evidence? Do we even have all the evidence? Because that's one of the other criticisms that sometimes gets made about the Bible is there are things the Bible reveals that we haven't found in archaeology or science or whatever it is. Is the lack of evidence evidence? That, that's not a true question. Is a lack of evidence evidence? No. You, you can't use a lack of evidence to prove anything or to, to make a point on anything. So just because something doesn't exist that... that validates a claim of Scripture, does that necessarily mean the claim's untrue? 